Janet Salas, an American housewife, in 1962 became the subject of a now famous medical film. I'll be sitting down alongside of you. And now, Janet, relax. Janet was preparing to have a baby by caesarean surgery using only hypnosis to control pain. And now you'll notice how comfortable it is as your eyes want to close. It's very difficult keeping them open. You might try once more and then notice they close tightly. And then you'll notice that as they close, you'll feel better. So all you do is just think of sleep and imagine yourself... Sleep. Mrs. Salis could not have her baby without caesarean surgery. She was also allergic to anesthetics. Her doctors felt that her only chance was to use hypnosis for pain control. The baby was born safely, and Mrs. Salis says she felt no discomfort. This film is about the doctors who are trying to understand how hypnosis works, and about patients like Mrs. Salis, who have learnt to use it for themselves. Today, Janet and her family live in a small North American town in Michigan. After her first success, Mrs. Salas decided to have the rest of her children by caesarean operations using hypnosis to control pain. She has now had three of them in this way. something different would happen to me, but it was not a mental change, it was a physical change. Wow. <laughs> uh, it, it was so different because I thought that my mind would play tricks or that it would, I would be unconscious, I guess, but my body went unconscious, which was the total difference. I relaxed to such an extent that after the delivery I couldn't get my rings back on, my hands were limp, my arms and legs my whole nervous system seemed to just be in a state of euphoria. I was just completely at peace with the world and with the peace people around me. And while you're relaxing, you know that there are a number of ways which we have talked about which will help you to relax deeper. Janet had always liked music and found that it helped her to relax physically if she could imagine herself playing the piano or by actually singing. A family doctor encouraged her to do this to achieve the depth of hypnosis necessary for surgery. I imagine you'd like to do this now, wouldn't you? Fine. So now, just imagine yourself relaxing deeply and at your piano, playing the piano. And watch, as you play the piano, you can relax deeper and deeper. And while you're playing the piano, you know how comforting it is. You know that as you play, you can relax even deeper when you begin to sing. And notice now how, as you begin to sing, you can relax deeper and deeper. And notice now how it works. Wonderful, and know that you can continue doing so as often as you wish. That's wonderful. That's all you need. A sponge stick. Just think of sleep. That's all you need. Just imagine yourself.
oh, I was delighted that it was all over with. It, it is a physical strain to concentrate that much on something when you know something else is going on around you. It's very easy to become distracted. In the very beginning, I had no knowledge of hypnosis. Um, I only had ever heard mystic ideas about it, the magic of it, and, this, and that you would give your mind over to somebody and you would do what they told you, and all this is so very untrue. Um, I found it to be just a, in my own layman's terms, I feel I just relaxed. And the fact that I relaxed so well, I had, I detached my mind from my body. I watched what was going on. I felt very comfortable with what was going on. And each time that I did it, it became much easier. Hi, Hi doctor. And Hank, let me Thank congratulate you. you. Everything was fine. How did it feel, Janet? Oh, wonderful. Did you enjoy yourself? Yes, because I knew every minute what you were doing. What were you doing? What were you imagining yourself doing when I was working? I was singing. You were singing, and what else? Oh, I was watching those, all the balls. The crystal colors, balls? Crystal balls, and they were red and green, and they were going back. And, and did you know what I was doing? Yes. What was I doing? What were you following? Well, you were, you were, I remembered when you, first they washed me, and, mm -hmm. and then you made, I think you made two cuts. Yes, go ahead. And then the, I could feel you probing for the baby. Mm -hmm. And you asked somebody if they were ready, and I thought maybe it would, it meant the sister was ready to take the baby, and then right away he started crying. Yes. And you told me to open my eyes so I could see him, and I, I just couldn't wait. Mm -hmm. And I did. Yes. And his head was up here, and his feet were this way. He held yes. him up this way. And he was, it's a boy. Yes. And then, uh, then you told me to shut my eyes. Yes. And I relaxed, and then I think, I think I was singing some more after that. Yes, what were you singing? Well, I started out with On This Day, Oh Beautiful Mother. Doctors filmed one of Janet's cesarean operations because they wished to convince skeptical medical colleagues that psychological techniques had a place in pain control. There were no pain-killing drugs used in the operations. Yeah, but I did give you something to all to drink and you left it, but you were cool enough anyhow. Yeah. Well, that's wonderful. I am sure that, uh, I can assure you that I had just as wonderful a time as you did. Thank you. Congratulations to you, you Teresa so Hard. Today, hypnosis is endorsed by the British and American medical associations, but there is still no generally accepted theory to explain it. In Montreal, pain researcher and theorist, Professor Ronald Melzack. Well, there's no question in my mind. It, it, it's real, all right. I've seen enough people un undergo experiments and tests with hypnosis that I'm sure uh, it, it changes the way people feel pain. How, in fact, does it do that? Well, that's a major problem, as you realize. But I think... Let, let me describe for just a moment some of the recent theories on pain. And one of them is known as the gate control theory, which was proposed by Patrick Wall and myself some years ago. Uh, what we say there is that pain signals are modified as they're transmitted up the spinal cord and through the brain. One of the sites where they can be modified and changed is at the first synapse in the spinal cord. But there are also changes which occur within the brain itself. Now, it's very important to recognize that when somebody ha is injured, the pain signals take a number of different courses in the brain. And some of these pathways lead to parts of the brain that are involved in the sensory discriminative aspects of pain. That is to say, you can say where it is, whether it shoots or moves or, or what it is like. Then there are other pathways that go into the medial part of the brain, the central part of the brain, and gain access to, a, to the limbic system, which is involved in affect and drive. In other words, you feel unpleasant, you feel awful, you want it to stop. It seems that one can discombobulate these two different kinds of effects. And so it's entirely possible that by giving commands, directions, and suggestions, it's, uh, it's, it's possible to affect the, the motivational component. I think it's possible then that the uh, hypnotic suggestion is able to act on that motivational affective component of pain. So the person is still able to describe what it is like, what the sensory features are like, but the affective component is different. I believe it is much more a psychological problem and will be understood in psychological rather than in biochemical terms. At Stanford University in California, 
Some of the basic facts about hypnosis have been established in research by one of America's leading psychologists, Professor Ernest Hilgar. And let happen whatever happens. You will find out that some movements... Many standardized hypnotic induction uh, tests automatic. have shown hypnosis to be a skill which most of us possess. You will learn how your thoughts control your actions. Uh, place your right hand on the arm, ready to float up and away. This skill is the capacity to respond to suggestion while under hypnosis. One in ten of us are highly responsive and probably could undergo major surgery. Perhaps slowly at first, but it is lifting up, up. Most of these are highly hypnotizable subjects. From the table. If it is not already lifted up, lifting, lifting. Less than one in ten cannot respond at all. When it is finally all the Most way of up, us, eight out of ten, possess this ability to some degree. A position. All right, just lower your hand uh, to the arm of the chair and just remain comfortably hypnotized. This capacity can be accurately measured. Differences in hypnotizability are so stable. I mean, they, we've studied people 10 years after having had only one hour of experience of hypnosis and they sort out just the same. The highs are highs and the lows are lows. So that you'd think there'd be personality correlates. So people have tried intelligence, they've tried various personality tests, they've had various hypotheses of basic trust or of dependency or of introversion and extroversion. None of these worked until we hit upon this capacity for imaginative involvement or absorption. Now, I'd like each of you just to say your own name, his or her name, as the case may be. Just say it out loud. All right, just say your name. Yeah. All right, you didn't have any trouble doing that. But now you'll find that it's, it's very difficult uh, to do it when I tell you that it's difficult to do it. Go ahead, say your name. Linda. For highly hypnotizable subjects, imagined events become more real to them than events in the outside world. Well, that, that's enough. Uh, you can say your name now. Go ahead, everybody say the name. Let's show you. Okay. What exactly is this imaginative skill? Well, I, I mean, really, the capacity uh, uh, to set uh, ordinary experiences aside. I mean, just, just the cares of the day, the uh, answering the mail, the uh, cooking the meals, the, the planning, the letters you're going to write tonight. Setting those things aside to just become deeply involved in a transporting kind of experience that, uh, that involves a great deal of imagination and fantasy. It's the same process that occurs when you watch a film and you identify with the hero and you begin to feel the hero's joy and feel his pain and experience what he experiences. That underlies the phenomenon of hypnosis and that process allows you to totally distort your experience. Professor Martin Orn is director of the unit for experimental psychiatry at the Institute of Pennsylvania Hospital in Philadelphia. He is with Stephen Schonwald, who is highly hypnotizable. When Stephen allows himself to become hypnotized, his experience of everyday reality is distorted. You'll become aware that the number six will be gone. The number between five and seven is gone. Five and seven is gone. Between seven and five is gone. Tell me, would you count from ten to one? Ten, nine, eight, seven, five, four, Three, two, one. That's right. And shortly you'll wake up and you'll still be aware that the number between five and seven is gone. It won't bother you, it'll just be gone. So I can say one, two, three, you'll wake up wide awake. One, two, three, four, wake up. How do you feel? Fine. Good. Would you count to ten? One, two, three, four, five, seven, eight, nine, ten. Would you count my hands for me? The fingers. One, two, three, four, five, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. One, two, three, four, five. Can you point to them as you can? One, two, three, four, five, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. One, two, three, four, five, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 
ใช่How many fingers are there here? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, now count these five. One, two, three, four, five. So how many fingers have I got? Ten. Right. Now count them. One, two, three, four, five, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. What am I doing wrong? I don't know. Tell me. It's not working out right. Close your eyes. Forget all about it. Forget all about it. Number is returning to your mind. You're becoming aware of it again, and you can now recall the number between five and seven. And you'll be aware of it when you wake up. One, two, three. You're wide awake. So you right. count from one to ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now you know what you were doing. Yes. Fine. How come? How did you feel when that occurred? Um, upset, uh -huh. uh, flustered. Flustered would be the better word for it. It just suddenly wasn't, you know, everything was a bit disjointed. Right. And um, I didn't know why. What Mr. Schoenwald did was to distort his experience. It is this which is ultimately used in pain control. Now, if I had the experience of counting not 10 but 11 fingers, I'd be really worried, not just mildly flustered. Now, what hypnosis does is not only to distort the perception, but also to alter the reaction to something which would otherwise be quite worrisome. The hypnotized subject can go further still, and he can alter his entire perceptual system. And as you open your eyes, you'll be able to see him in 1960, Martin Orne hypnotized this man on a Canadian television program. Standing on the right is the television presenter, Lister Sinclair. Orne told the subject he would see Lister in another part of the room. He will respond to this suggestion by hallucinating him. He now sees both the hallucination and the real man. Tell me, would you point to Mr. Sinclair? Uh, would you tell me who this gentleman is over here? wrong, I know. Mr. Sinclair. And who is that? It's Mr. Sinclair. Why do you say it's wrong? Hear the subject's sight, his hearing, and you will see later even his sense of touch are changed. His sense of reality, his perception, is altered. He doesn't look... <laughs> smiling and yet he's not smiling the two of them one is smiling and one isn't which one smiles? this one and this one he isn't professor hilgard demonstrated the same phenomenon with students at stanford in, in hypnosis i think what we're going to do now you'll find very interesting now tony i want you to come over and sit in the chair on, on this side uh, uh, that's fine. Uh, yes, just, just, just right here. All right. Uh, now, Cheryl, will you look to the left? And uh, who do you see there? Tony. Okay. And which hand is he wearing your watch on? It's on her right um, mm. wrist. Uh huh. You want to point to it? Well, that's uh, that's that's fine. Now look again to your right. Now look back to your left. Is he both places? Yes. <laughs> Do they look just alike? Yes. I'm really going to let you in on a little secret. One of them is hallucinated. I gathered that. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, just touch both of them. Touch the one on the left and the one on the right. See if they feel just the same. Would you mind touching him? Touching the other one? There. Notice that he touched him way higher than he normally would, where your head would really be. It's quite real to him, but this doesn't mean that it's completely accurate. He's 
do like that. Both of them are there? Yes, it seems, this seems as if it should be, and yet something, um, it's been explained to me that he wasn't, yet I know that he is. Well, one of these two must be an image that you've projected. This is the experience one can have in a sense. See if you can figure out some way. I'll make her do something. Yes. Now, don't say anything, though. Just use your mind, because the hallucination is in your mind. OK. She's real. Uh, now, how do you know? Because that was kicking her leg. <laughs> that's what you asked that she should do? Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, that's fine. I knew that it was wrong. Somehow, I think I knew that it was wrong, and yet it was perfectly reasonable and uh, perfectly natural to see Lister sitting smiling at me and Lister standing just looking at me. Well, was there anything seemed strange about that one? Well, except the fact he had this certain quality about him, but physically they were exactly the same. His hair felt the same. The jacket, uh, the fabric felt the same. But there's a certain quality about this one. Um, ethereal, is it? Perhaps some, something that, he, that I... I uh, Completely at peace, he was with me. He, we were of one accord, perhaps. Um, if I had asked you uh, which one of these was real, I mean, did one seem more real than the other? I don't know if one seemed more real, but I was... Uh, I liked this one. Um, well, you, you should. Know. He's yours. <laughs> does she just disappear all at once, or does she fade away? Oh, she's still there. <laughs> huh? She's still there. Oh, she's going to disappear. Now, now you watch. You, you can see the chair through her. She's, she's diaphanous, we say. You see, you see the chair through her? Yeah, she's starting to go. Yeah, that's... Uh-huh. <laughs> see, Tony on this side is very real, and this one has started to go. She, she's almost gone now, isn't she? Yeah, uh, she's gone. She's gone. Uh-huh. All right, well, that's fine. All right, now just close your eyes and just bring yourself out of hypnosis now. I'll help you by telling American researchers are coming to recognize that the unique characteristic of hypnosis is that it allows us to change our perception of everyday reality. By the way, you'll remember everything now that we did. Wasn't that kind of an interesting experiment? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it was. <laughs> you hallucinated the whole person. It was, it was really pretty convincing to you, wasn't it? That yes, it was. That was weird. The same mechanism that allows you to lose the number six, to hallucinate in a way that is totally compelling to yourself, also allows you to modify the sense of pain or to block it entirely. Now, the altered perception depends upon focusing your attention and utilizes imagination. It is the ability to imagine deeply which seems to help individuals to modify their sense of pain. And I'm now going to ask you to imagine the pain as a color. Imagine the pain that you experience from your shoulder to your hand is a color. And I'm gonna ask you to think of that color getting smaller and smaller and shrinking so that ultimately it is so small it's no larger than a grain of sand. Can hypnotized patients turn off pain by simply changing their perception of the pain, in the same way as Professor Orne's subjects changed their experience? Professor Frankel is being visited for the first time by Leslie Roberts, a patient at the Beth Israel Hospital in Boston. Following a road accident, she has suffered severe and continual pain, relieved only by switching on an electrode on her arms. Leslie is thought to be highly hypnotizable, the doctor's first suggestion, that she imagine her pain as a color that gets smaller, does not work for her. Would you like to suggest to me what you feel might make the pain get less? If I could make my arm warmer. You think that you would get more relief by having it warmer rather than by having it reduce the color? Yes. Mm -hmm. Which hand would you like to try? Shall we try the left this time? Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Are you comfortable with that or would you prefer the right? No, that's okay. Okay. Just continue to relax at this point. And perhaps if you would allow yourself to imagine that you have a very warm feeling in your hands, your forearms, all the way up to the shoulders. And you can do that any way you wish, either by imagining it in front of a warm, open fireplace, comfortably seated, or bathing in the sun. Just feel the warm feeling develop in your hand and your forearm. which you can also extend to the other arm if you'd like. Just imagine that you feel the warmth increasing. And as it does, will you kindly let me know, either by telling me or by nodding your head. Okay. Okay. Is there increased comfort? There's no pain. There's no pain. No. I felt as if I was by a fireplace mm -hmm. with the fire and the heat making my arms warmer. Mm -hmm. And the warm is really the thing that stops the pain. Mm -hmm. Because in the cold, the pain is worse. Mm -hmm. So if I can keep them warm, then the pain goes. The hypnotic induction procedure creates a degree of relaxation that helps the patient distract attention and it also creates an atmosphere of optimistic expectation. Those three items on their own, quite apart from hypnosis, and they're not essential to hypnosis, will help an individual achieve some degree of comfort or an ability to endure pain or to tolerate it. The effect of hypnosis specifically, I would say, comes from the fact that it can alter perception. So that if, in addition to the effects of the other three, you have the altered perception, you're that much further along in the relief of the discomfort. But if the appreciation of pain can be changed, does the pain itself disappear? In Professor Orne's laboratory, a medical student is about to take part in a demonstration which will show how, even though his perception of pain is altered by hypnosis, the information from the physical stimulus still reaches the brain. Here, heartbeat and skin resistance are recorded, showing his physiological response to stress when an electric shock is administered. All right, what I'd like you to do now is, I'm shortly going to give you a shock, and when I do, um, I'd like you to rate it on a one to 10 scale, where one is no feeling at all, and 10, the most severe shock you can imagine, all right? Mm -hmm. At this stage, the student is fully awake. The shock registers at the top of the readout. What would you consider? I would say about a seven. A seven. Fine. All right. I'd just like you to just relax yourself, sit back in the chair and make yourself comfortable. Mm -hmm. Relaxing more and more. Deep and deeper. That's right. You'll feel quite... The student is now hypnotized. When the same electric shock is given again, he is told he will feel no pain. No pain at all. Can you barely feel this? Barely. That's right. That's right. At the top of the readout, his physiological responses to pain still register, even though he experiences no pain subjectively. What did you feel? Vibration. Would you consider it on a one to 10 scale? What would you call it? One. That's right. If you can block pain by suggestion, can you produce pain by suggestion? This time the electrode without his knowledge is disconnected. Though he doesn't know it, he can't feel a shock, but he will be told he can feel one. It will have the same kind of intensity. All right, shortly you will feel the shock. You will hear the stimulus go on. Surprisingly, the imagined pain signals will still register. Hypnotic suggestion alone produced a physiological pain response. This implies that pain involves a large psychological element and that psychological techniques like hypnosis have a part to play in controlling pain, although its cause must be medically treated first. Remember everything that has happened. Are you ready to wake up now? 
Yes. All right. Three, two, one, wide awake. How do you feel? Good. Very Could you good. describe the shock that you had? It was tingling line up and down my forearm. Oh. No. Right. And centrally located at the electrode. Mm -hmm. In science, it's important not only to show that you can block something, but also that you can cause something by the same mechanism. And here what we saw is that hypnosis could block the appreciation of pain so that the subject didn't hurt at all. And yet the physiological response was still present. By the same token, when we took off the connection to the shock machine so that there could be no shock and simply played the tone and told him he would feel it, then he had the appreciation of pain, he had the experience of pain, but there was no pain stimulus. And he still had then the physiological effect of pain. So the psychological process could cause the physiological effect of pain much as the shock would cause the physiological effect of pain. What does this tell us about the mechanism of hypnosis itself? Well, hypnosis, we know some things about it. Uh, we know that it can block pain and it is clinically useful. And we know that some people are able to block pain completely. And that this ability is related to the skill of imagination. The people who have that do it much better than the people who don't have the skill. But does success in the laboratory mean success in the hospital? Can you and I and any patient do it? Professor Ronald Melzack. It's so easy if you do studies with students as subjects. You simply sign them up and they come in at the prescribed hour and there they are and you can do your experiment. But if you have to wait around for patients with low back pain or migraine headache, you have a heck of a time. Uh, somebody who may be having a terrible headache, com headache comes into the hospital, into the clinic, ready to be examined, and suddenly the headache vanishes. You know, just as a toothache will vanish the moment you walk into the dentist's office. So one simply has to be very patient. What we really need are good experiments with clinical pain, real clinical pain, like phantom limb pain. But lack of time and money has prevented proper experiments. Instead, doctors are having to rely on the random experience of individual patients, like taxi driver Harold Librak, for deciding if hypnosis can be useful for all of us. Even though Harold's leg was amputated as long ago as 1964, he still has pain in the nerve endings of his stump. This is called phantom limb pain. He describes it in a diary which his doctor asked him to write. Wednesday, 11th of February, 6 a.m., pain probably woke me up with a very strong tingling in the whole of the leg, the leg that isn't there. Pain coming directly from stump, from nerve ends. Did not subside until 11 p.m. Wednesday, the 18th of February, 9 p.m., the pain started. 10 p.m. took two paracetamol, no effect. Managed to sleep for one hour between five and six. The pain persisted all day Saturday, Thursday, March the 26th. Very severe pain woke me up at 2 a.m. Worst night I've had since the first 10 weeks after losing leg. The pain has persisted ever since Harold lost his leg 17 years ago. All treatments have failed. His face was gaunt, grey, and he was very, very tired because he didn't sleep. Many times he didn't go to work because he couldn't work in the traffic. And it was, it was very, very terrible to watch somebody being in pain and not being able to help them, which is, you know, you feel so helpless. I just drove him mad to take pills which they didn't help. I could only control the pain by a heated discussion, intense concentration, and sex. Well, he's very lucky that I enjoy my sex life. But he used to con me. Eventually, I f the doctor gave me this number and I phoned the hypnotist. And I knew he wouldn't want to go because it's expensive. But in the end, I threatened to stop all his okay. rights to everything. And I think that helped too. And he phoned up, made an appointment. Do you come into the service? 
three, four lighter and lighter, five, six, nearly there, seven, eight, fully awake and feeling great. Can I ask you something? We mentioned the tender spot on the stump. Yes. Now, that's the only part that's really physical. Quite. Well, the, the nerve ends at the back of the stump. Mm -hmm. Where does this physical pain ah. come from? Nerves, unfortunately, don't always relay exactly where the nerve is, the sensation of pain. They nearly always do come to the surface somewhere or another, and it just happens that it's there as opposed to the actual center of your stump. So-called referred sensation. But unlike highly hypnotizable laboratory subjects, Harold's pain did not magically disappear. After five months, the pain was still there, and Harold was about to abandon hypnosis. But in the beginning, nothing happened, and... Uh, she thought I wasted my money. He was very despondent, and I felt guilty that he'd spent all this money. But as, as we were told, it's like you plant a seed. It doesn't grow immediately, it takes time to grow. And all of a sudden, I think, you, he realised that the pain had gone. You know, it just crept up on us, and I thought, he's sleeping. Well, it's only just recently that it's the pain has subsided and the periods in between have got lengthened. This is the first time for 17 years? 17 years. How do you explain it? It's all in the mind. A miracle. The doctor who treated Harold is chairman of the Royal Society of Medicine's hypnosis section. How does he find his patients respond? Totally individually, and it's, uh, so far we've not found any way of um, clearing that point up in terms of age, sex, whatever it may be. Uh, some respond exceedingly well and others uh, take a long, long time before they do respond, but on the whole we expect about 80% to, to clear up the uh, symptom, whatever it may be. To what extent would it help to really be able to predict who and why? Well, it would help enormously. But, um, as I say, we've looked into so many factors, and uh, we've put many factors into computers, and we still haven't found um, a pointer that will tell us in advance. Obviously, a great deal of research still needs to be done into the subject. Any other questions uh, before you have your treatment? No, I don't think so. All right, then, fine. Well, now, if you'd like to settle down, put yourself under. Would it take you and me, like Harold, five months to control pain? Or could we do it instantly? Or would we fail? Does success depend on the skill of the doctors, or simply on how hypnotizable we are? At present, there are no firm answers to these basic medical and scientific questions. Some doctors believe only highly responsive people block pain, but others are convinced that all of us can be helped. In Los Angeles, Dr. Joe Barber. My own view is that almost anyone can be hypnotized if you approach them in the right way. If you give an individual a chance by being permissive enough and being indirective enough to promote their own individual hypnotic abilities, it doesn't matter whether that individual's measured susceptibility is high or low. For instance, at the University of California Pain Management Center in Los Angeles, we had a patient some years ago, a young man who had been a policeman and had a very severe back injury sustained on the job. He had had back surgery to repair the injury, but even still he had a severe pain problem, a chronic pain problem that uh, probably was the result of a chronic nerve root irritation. It was as though someone else were uh, drilling in your mouth and you were saying that's enough and it didn't make any any dent in them and they kept drilling and drilling and drilling with uh, no relief and it eventually takes over your your body your mind we went to dozens of doctors and after the second surgery it was a matter of a third surgery will probably make you worse and some of the doctors said, well, I'll do it, but I won't be responsible. And some of the doctors said, I won't touch you. And they had no answer for me. Lane Braver had to give up his police job, moved out of Los Angeles, and began to breed tropical birds for a living. 
A semi-invalid, he could not lift weights. He bought himself a mobile home on barren land in the country. For Lane Braver, hypnosis was a treatment of last resort, and he wasn't very good at it. Doctors had rated his hypnotic skills as low. With all this against him, how could he learn the psychological techniques that are necessary to change the experience of pain? And we finally went to the University of California to their pain control center, where the hypnosis was offered, and it was not only a last-ditch effort, but something that I was very skeptical about. So I saw him depressed, very disabled. He uh, spent most of his time lying down in bed, um, and he was angry. And it seemed important to me not to promise him that I was going to help him, but to rather give him some very implicit expectation that some kind of help was on the way. And then I made it more and more clear that that help was going to come from within him because I believed that it was clear that no one else was going to help him. The first time that I saw Dr. Barber, it was more of an introduction. We talked uh, for a short time. Um, it, I was waiting for him to put me in a trance and say, your pain is gone and, and go home. And it didn't happen. I was a little disappointed, but yet, for whatever reason, I felt that I would continue the therapy. It was my judgment in that first meeting with him that he would be one of those people who would probably be a low susceptible and would have trouble developing a hypnotic state if I went at it in a usual, traditional, direct kind of way. So rather than do that, rather than telling him what to do, to which he might not respond well, I simply implied some things he might do. I showed him, for instance, that uh, his back and his right leg were hurting very much, and he was paying a lot of attention to that. And I said, while you're paying attention to that, you don't have any awareness of your left hand, do you? And then he paid attention to his left hand, and I said, and while you're paying attention to your left hand, you're not really noticing the feelings along the right side of your face, do you? But now you can pay attention to the right side of your face, but while you do that, you don't notice your left shoulder. And so on, simply giving him uh, an example of how he could change his attention. Up to that point, I had not had a pain-free minute or second uh, since the injury and I was sitting in a nice fluffy chair and we were talking and he started telling me about the beach and waves and uh, things that didn't seem to relate to my problem and I was getting a little annoyed actually and all of a sudden I said something to him to the effect of well wait a second something's wrong I don't feel the same way I did there's there's not the intensity all of a sudden now as an example of how I talked with him, we can look at a videotape that I made, and you'll get some sense of the language we used and how it was that I worked with him. A few minutes ago, we talked about the fact that if you were to rate your pain on a scale of zero to 10, you were feeling a pain equivalent to four. And sometimes you feel more than that. I wonder if you'll be surprised, or pleased, or maybe curious to notice that when you awaken, the number you feel is the number you see, and the number you see is not four, is not three, is not two, but is one. Now, I didn't say to him that the numbers would go all the way to zero. Because again, that's my saying to him, I'm going to completely cure your pain. I suggested the numbers would get smaller, maybe as small as a two, maybe even as small as a one. Now, obviously, he would like it to be a zero. So then his energy, instead of saying to me, well, I don't think I can do as well as you're suggesting, is perhaps I can do better than you're suggesting. By the way, Lane, how does your right leg feel? Uh, it feels OK. It's like one. A number one? Or a half. Or a half? Yeah. Yeah, I know. There you go. Come on. Uh. At the beginning, I would have to concentrate uh, very deeply on getting out of the pain by going into hypnosis. I'm finding that as time goes on, that it's more of an automatic occurrence. I can stretch the amount of time that I do something 
from 15 minutes to say 20 minutes or 25 minutes by tr going into the hypnosis and out of the hypnosis and in while I'm working. I do the exercises because if I didn't do the exercises for more than two or three days, I wouldn't be able to walk around, I wouldn't be able to bend. Um, it's given me much more mobility than I think even the doctors thought that I would ever have. What's happened is that I brought the exercise program past the level that was expected of me and do them faithfully. And it's given me a great deal of mobility that I don't think I would have otherwise. So it's very important to me. You can take the zero with you and the one half with you and you can keep the numbers as small as you need to so that whenever your leg is bothering you, you can just let it become more and more comfortable. Do you know that? That's great. What I was trying to do there was to give Lane and a, a way to experience this kind of comfort at a later period when, when I'm not with him necessarily. This is called a post-hypnotic suggestion. That is, during the hypnotic state, I give the patient a suggestion that will take place at a later time. For instance, I say to him now, something like, uh, whenever you want to recreate this feeling of comfort, all you have to do is take a deep breath or something like that. And that will elicit automatically, by virtue of your unconscious abilities, this kind of comfort. What was it the last time I asked you? Uh, it was four. Uh -huh. And what is it right now? Um, between a half and one. Mm -hmm. Do you see the number in your mind? Where is it? It's right back. Okay. All right. I want you to watch as the number becomes a two. Tell me when you feel the two. Yeah. And now as it becomes a three, tell me how you notice the feeling change. When I see a three, I'm more aware of uh, where the pain is going and where it is and how it's traveling. Mm -hmm. And do you mind the numbers getting larger? Yes. Uh -huh. but I don't mind it for a short time. Uh -huh. So long as you know they're going to get small again. Right. All right, I'd like you to discover what it feels like to suddenly see six. The moment there where I was suggesting that the numbers get larger, I'm sure seems like a, a cruel, sadistic thing to do. What I was doing was giving him an experience of controlling it himself independent of what I tell him. For instance, I was saying, let the numbers get larger. Now suddenly notice what a six feels like. Well, I'm not sure what a six feels like, but I'm sure it's very painful. And he doesn't want to feel that, so even though he is in a profound hypnotic trance, and even though I'm sure he wants to cooperate with me, it's in his more fundamental interest to not feel pain, and so he doesn't increase the numbers, and he doesn't feel the pain. What do you feel right now? I'm, uh, when you're saying the larger numbers, I'm just uh, relaxing more and letting it... Uh, get to a, a, a lower level mm -hmm. and rather than fighting the numbers I'm just uh, playing around with them mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. it's an example of the fact that just because someone is hypnotized doesn't mean they'll do what you tell them just as you cannot hypnotize someone unless they want you to so they will not do what you tell them unless they want to I told him to make the numbers get larger and he didn't it was a matter of going back and learning step by step by step how and when I can control the pain, how long I can control it. How did you do that? The methods that I used mostly was remembering how it was the one, the first time that I was out of pain. I would try to remember exactly what happened. I would try to remember the feeling and I've kind of continued that through the years in that if I want to get rid of the pain is not so much a matter of going into a trance as remembering feelings. It's a matter of almost changing tracks on a tape recorder or on a videotape and going back to how it was when it didn't hurt. It's taken a long time, but then I, I assumed it would take a long time and I went slowly and sometimes patiently because he has a lifetime during which he has to cope with this problem 
and uh, I wanted him to slowly and really, um, I wanted him to really well develop this over a slow period of time. And now it's been, I think, nearly five years, and I see him infrequently as a way to simply follow him and perhaps uh, sometimes to reinforce the kinds of things he's learned. But yes, he's done very well. Given that time, does that not limit the effectiveness of hypnosis? Well, it would obviously be nice if it only took one session. The fact is, there wasn't really anything else for this patient. When, when there isn't any other treatment available, then I don't know what else you can do. Yes, it would be much more effective if it only took 10 seconds. How often do you have failures? Well, we don't remember our failures. We only succeed. When I realized that there was hope, I decided to find a place such as this that I could adapt to my abilities. Okay. I found that raising birds is something that I can do with my limitations and is something that I enjoy doing and goes quite well with the lifestyle that I've chosen for myself. Oh, hey, Jonathan and Crystal, you get your show now. What's the matter? What's the matter? Come on. Come on Where would you be now without hypnosis? I suspect that I'd still be in bed. My outlook on life would be as terrifying as it was three years ago, four years ago, if I were alive.